Welcome everyone to this sixth Sunday of Easter and the focus of our reflection today will be what loving Jesus really means. So as we come to wrestle with that statement, let's begin by listening to the, to the Gospel reading assigned for this Sunday from the Gospel of John. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, and because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Um, really, this is just a continuation of last week's Gospel. Um, it's interesting that in those two Gospels that one verse was left out that we added last week. But the point is, is about um, what does it mean to love Jesus? And I think the point is very clear there that we need to keep the commandments of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says that, uh, um, that just as he kept the Father's commandments and remained in the Father's love, we remain in his love by keeping the commandments. And I think that emphasises that the loving Jesus is action. It's doing something. I think we face an issue in the world today, in our culture today, where morality is a sort of a personal thing, you know, it's really, um, it's up to me what I do, it's my conscience sort of thing. But I, I think Jesus is saying is that there's an objective reality that needs to be looked at in relationship to that. Um, and if we are friends of Jesus, uh, we need to be aware of that. He says there, a man can have no greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So I think living according to the teaching of Jesus and doing that in union with Jesus is the ultimate thing about being a disciple of Jesus. It's living one's ordinary life in union with Jesus according to the teaching of Jesus. And I think that's a, a good summary of where it is. Um, Jesus is asking the Father um, to send us another advocate. The very fact that Jesus is asking means that he is an advocate. The word another suggests that the Spirit is going to carry on um, the mission of Jesus. Notice that the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. You know, I often mention God is the truth, the one I am the truth, Spirit of truth, we walk in the truth. So, so clearly what's happening here is that the Spirit is bringing that whole mystery of the Godhead of the divine um, into our lives. And it, he says there about the Spirit, um, that we'll know the Spirit because the Spirit abides in us, that wonderful word, um, abide. And uh, it, it means that just as Jesus abides in us, and he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So we can say that of the Spirit as well. And I think in John there's a sense of, um, of that deep interior relationship with the Spirit, with, with God. Uh, over the weekend, I was working with our seminarians, and we did something from John Roy, John of Roysbrook, who was a mystic of the 14th century, and he makes a distinction about the journey to God. There's an external start, then there's an interior dimension, and the third stage, he talks about the stage where we're getting in touch with that presence of the divine that keeps us into existence. In other words, that when we come to the, this stage, whereas normally we work from without here we are beginning to work from within. So that abiding thing is, I think, very, very strong. 
Um, Jesus is not going to leave us orphans, he's going, but he's going to come back. Scholars debate whether that means coming back on the last day or coming back on the resurrection. I think it's more likely to be coming back on the resurrection. They will see Jesus when he is risen. And I think when um, he is risen, um, we will know that he is in the Father, that we are in him, and he is in us. So that's drawing us um, together. There's a, a, a wonderful statement in John 17 where um, Jesus prays um, that um, may they all be one in us as you are in me and I am in you. So we're being drawn in to that mystery of the divine life and the context of here, that means it affects the way we live. It affects the fact that we live um, according um, to the teaching of Jesus. And they've got another statement there um, about living, I just forget the exact uh, quote that's there, that um, Jesus lives and we too live. And it's, it's not an and there like the epigenetical and from last week, but it's the same causative effect, that because Jesus lives, we live. And what is this life that we live? It is that life that Jesus in the Father, we are in Jesus, and Jesus in us. So it, it's pointing to that um, being captured and, and brought up um, into the divine life. And how do we do it? What's it all about? Well, the Gospel repeats the sort of message that it began with. Um, those, they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. I mentioned Roy's book, he has a wonderful saying that he says, love the love that ever loves you. In other words, God has loved us, and the response is love, and I think the response is a love, that, a love in action, a love with commandments. Yeah. Yeah. The Christ life, I think, we talk about things like service and discipleship and following, and, and that's all true, important. But I'm thinking in the light of what we've been sharing today from the Gospel, it's, it's, a, it's more than that. It's, it's living that um, or abiding in the Trinitarian life of God. And, and that changes the, in some way it seems to me, the whole dynamic of how we respond to the, the Christ life given to us in the waters of our baptism. Well, I think I'm about to lower the tone here. I just, <laughs> I just thought... You don't I, lower I, I do. Well, what, the phrase that really struck me was, I will not leave you orphaned. And at the moment, you know, in our different personal lives, I have the son, the daughter... the the daughter, the son-in-law and two babies at our house, you know, one and three. And looking at the, oh, the dedication of parents, the babies through the night, all I can think is, thank God I don't have to get up to that baby. You know, one's awake at midnight, one's awake at two, another one's at three, the early one gets up at 4 a.m. And you look at these exhausted parents and I can't help being overwhelmed by, I don't, the love of a father or mother for a child, when Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned, I will be there for you. And it's kind of struck me on that very basic note that the parents are there again and again and again. You know, good parents, like when he's describing the father, I will and I will not leave you orphaned, it kind of really struck in my heart what it must be left to be an orphaned adult. Right. That has no one that you think is there for you. And for me, the expression there for you in the middle of the night, you know, the dark night. So, um, yeah, I just think it's such a powerful image that he uses to describe That's that nice. lifelong relationship. And in, in either next week or the week after, we've got that, um, those words that finish the Gospel of Matthew, I will be with you all always. Always. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Always. always. Yes, it's a, so uh, and just an aside, I do think that's where you really learn to pray, as you know, at three in the morning. Yes. You know, God help me, I can't <laughs> yeah. do this another minute. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I, I'm just so enriched by the reflection of David and Virginia, and and, uh, and I trust that you are too. But take a moment now to wrestle with that word that we've shared, not to come up with what we have, but really what is it saying to you as you depth the, your understanding of and uh, the, the place of God's word in your own life? Well, as we move back from our short time of reflection on the Gospel, let's listen to it again and see what our reflections have meant in the light of the Word that we hear once more. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. I think I've been challenged by something Virginia said, the relevance of the Word of God for my life. <clears throat> And often I can see it not apart from, but not really integrated into. So what I'd like to, to reflect on this week is how is that presence of the risen Lord alive and active in me? How do I see that presence in the world in which I live, in the life that is mine each day? And the thing that struck me is the question of love. You know, how well do I love? Um, I think I like that. I think I love those people who love me, but I don't know if I'm. If that's the spirit of this passage. I think it's um, how well am I reaching out in love? Yeah, we've got a bit of work to do. Yes, I, I focused on the word commandments as, as the symbol of loving Jesus, and I was contrasting commandments and counsels. Mm. Commandments are things you have to do, yeah. and counsels are things like the attitudes and that that you don't have to do, but as you get closer to the Lord, they are as important as the commandments. In other words, bringing us to, to a deeper mm. intimacy with Jesus. So I thought that um, I might just reflect on that, that not am I keeping the commandments, I think to a certain extent I am doing that mm. in regard to the big things, but with regards to those um, counsels and the, the smaller things that can keep us from the Lord, am I addressing those? You have heard Virginia and David and myself just reflecting on the challenge that the Word of God has offered to us, a challenge for the week ahead. We invite you to take time now to reflect yourselves and in that reflection, what is it you want to take from your reflection to live or strive to live in the course of the coming week? Welcome back. All of us have taken time to reflect on the challenge of God's word for the coming week. But we know our intent today may not be realised unless we spend a moment in prayer, inviting our God and the strength of the Spirit to be with us, to walk with us and to prompt us each day to, to remember what we have committed ourselves to in the course of this week. So take a moment to reflect on what it is that you have chosen to do and who it is who's going to be your support, your God in that journey.
Well, we thank you for joining us today in reflecting on the Gospel reading for the sixth Sunday of Easter. We invite you to join us again next week and hopefully be enriched by the Word of God as we find ourselves constantly enriched by and challenged by that Word that we might grow in this Christ life that we've committed ourselves to through the waters of our own baptism. Let's end today by praying, as we customarily do, the opening prayer of the liturgy, and for now, today, the liturgy of this sixth Sunday in ordinary time. O oh God, who teach us that you abide in hearts that are just and true, grant that we may be so fashioned by your grace as to become a dwelling pleasing to you. Through Christ our Lord. 